a little romantic relationship would never get through a writer's room today because it's just unbelievably fucked up. But (laughs) boy, was it good. Welcome back to Entertainment Weekly's Binge of the Vampire Diaries. I'm your host, Sam Heifel, and joining me today to talk all things season three is executive producer Julie Pleck, writer Michael Narducci, and Rebecca Michelson herself, Claire Holt. As the disclaimer I put on every episode of this podcast, which I will also now put on this one, is we're primarily focusing on season three, but we reserve the right to go on tangents and spoil all the things. So there is a series-wide spoiler alert on every single episode of this. Watch all eight seasons, then come listen to this, basically. Okay, we're talking my my favorite season. I'm like hesitant to say it, but I'm also not because it's my favorite season. Commit uh, to it. Just say I, it. I like I I put it in <laughs> I put it in print before, so I'm fully committed <laughs> to it. Um, season three of the Vampire Diaries. I feel like if we're starting quite literally at the beginning of this season, obviously the big kind of new thing about season three is. Stefan's off being Stefan's kind of the bad brother now. Damon's kind of filling the role of the good brother. I remember distinctly watching the season three premiere and then going up and writing in my own diary about how much I loved how dark you all, I mean, specifically Stefan killing Andy. Like that was the thing where I was like, how, how far are they going to take this? Am I going to be okay with it? Because like Stefan is my heart and soul. And, but like, loving kind of just like how far you all pushed it. And I'm wondering, like, Julie, was that, was that the big question going into this season of like, how dark can we take our hero if we're ultimately going to pull him back? Yes, absolutely. There was, um, there's always that fear of the, I'll call it like the audience hypocrisy, right? Which is like letting one character get away with absolutely everything, AKA Damon Salvatore. (laughs) But then ultimately having like a purity rejection of the other character's sins. And so there was a danger there that we had to consider, but also we really, really wanted for multiple reasons. One, because it was so dramatic and so interesting. And two, Paul Wesley was just dying to play that darkness and to be the, you know, the bad boy. When we really wanted to take him as far as we could, but like also understand just how, completely fraught he was on the inside as he's faking his way through this Klaus, Bonnie and Clyde partnership. You know, it's like being undercover, having to commit and you'll come out the other side wondering if you yourself are going to be a junkie. And that was really the goal of that. Which leads to like the most heartbreaking phone call in the history of phone phone call. The phone call. And am I wrong? Was that, was that a drop in the ocean? That was a drop in the ocean by Ron Pope. Yeah. I love you, Stefan. Hold on to that. Never let that go. I know. (laughs) Season three is filled with a lot of really good song moments, too. I mean, the first three seasons, I remember most of them. And then after that, it's all a blur. But yeah. Oh, yeah. But as we're going through the season, episode three, we've got like this phenomenal 1920s flashback. We're in Chicago. We've got the introduction of the original sister. Claire, what was your introduction to the show? Were you familiar with it before you were on it? So I hadn't seen all of it. I'd seen some of it. Um, But obviously I was a huge fan of Kevin and Julie. And what actually happened is I had tested for another show, The Secret Circle, and I didn't get the job. And then in uh, this audition came up and I was like, wow, this would be amazing. I would still get the opportunity to sort of live in this world a little bit. So I did my research, I did my homework, but I didn't know anything about the character because originally it was a three episode guest star. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, and they didn't really give us any scoop about her. Um, It was just like one scene, one audition scene. And I went in and I had no freaking idea what I was doing and I probably blew it. And thank God they gave me a chance. but I got the job and I was so excited, but I just didn't know what it was going to look like because uh, I hadn't sort of had any creative conversations with anyone. I just trusted that it was going to be a great thing and a great opportunity. And and so when I got that first script and I saw who Rebecca was for the first time, I was just like, my heart was like so happy. It's a dream as an actor to be able to play someone who's so fun and sassy 
and like smart and I got to go toe to toe with Stefan in that first episode and uh, it was just such a like cool and beautiful start to what would be a really long journey for me. Please help yourself. No, oh, I always do. Hmm. Careful, Mr. Salvatore. You're still wearing your date. She's not. Well, so Julie, I forgot she, about that episode. That's so funny. I, I love that episode. It's, <laughs> it's an, so affair, an affair to remember, right? Uh-huh. It's, it's, and uh, Chris Grisman directed it. Yeah. And yeah. Dries, Dries wrote that script. And I remember yeah. uh, when we were breaking it. And I remember when I saw the final script, I thought it was brilliant. Uh, Caroline is such a great writer. And I thought that was such a cool uh, introduction to Rebecca's character, but also the story in the past was as, just as compelling as a story in the present as Stefan and Elena are coming face to face, you know, hiding in that dark corner and Klaus is right outside and there's the names of all yeah, those victims the on the wall. Yeah. It was just so great. And then there's in the flashback scene, Stefan compelling that poor guy who's just looking for his wife, compelling him to drink her blood. It was just so disturbing and weird. Dumb, and we've yeah. never <laughs> seen that kind of Stefan before. And then also, you know, this thing with Rebecca having been daggered for decades, which we then, you know, uh, implied that it had happened before. And then we did show it happening to Rebecca in the originals in the series that he had. This is kind of the thing that he does to her to kind of keep her nearby. But every time she gets out of line, he punishes her in this way. So you understand that this, you know, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear, but this badass, tough lady, Rebecca, is also in this abusive, codependent relationship with her maniacal brother so everything just kind of came together in a really cool way in that episode i thought it was brilliant really very nice well-written yeah. script yeah agreed 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 and 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 claire i mean and it's funny i don't remember your casting story which probably means you were the person that we wanted from the beginning and it just happened because i usually i remember the dramatic ones right <laughs> it's like right. fighting to the death or crying or you know desperate and angry but and honestly, like seeing that episode come together and and it really was firing in all cylinders, but watching Klaus and Rebecca and Stefan in that corner booth having a raucous gay old time. Stefan, don't be mean. What the hell are you doing? like just was i mean it's so sophisticated it's it's cable it's it's it, there's nothing simple or dumb about that and, and and what a character introduction it was also the reveal that like stefan had known klaus i still remember yes. the like scree i was so shocked it was so and weird. it was it was klaus i, I now it's all coming back to me huh <laughs> Klaus compelling him, like the idea being like at another time we could have been friends, right? Like, yep. you know, like I really wish that I didn't have to do this. I didn't, you know, that I, that I, that this was a good time. And then understanding that one of the reasons why our big bad villain was like hauling present day Stefan Salvatore across, you know, the, the, the South was kind of like lonely guy who needed a friend, which became the defining characteristic of Klaus's duality for mm -hmm. the next six years. And yeah. they were fleeing Chicago, which at one point you thought Chicago would be the setting for the originals. Is that is that right? Yes, that's right. That's right. We thought, oh, my goodness. We thought that Chicago, because of their history there, would be the great, um, the great place to set the spinoff. And it wasn't until... I can't remember who pitched New Orleans. Do you remember who pitched New Orleans? It was you, you said a friend of yours said you should set it in New Orleans. It was some uh, personal friend of yours because you brought yeah, it in. They had just shot there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And then yeah. then we went with Marguerite to kind of, you know, suss it out. So, I mean, it was yeah. a really great trip. That was also the episode that introduced the idea of Michael and like that there is like the big bad dad. Yeah. Which is yeah. incredible. But I do want to touch on, I mean, we're talking a lot. Obviously, that episode is a huge point in terms of Klaus's evolution and going from just coming in as like just seen as this big bad villain and kind of learning more about him. And I know, Julie, you've said a lot that you kind of like credit Michael with kind of discovering the voice of Klaus because you were the first person 
to write Klaus in season two when he was Alaric right. Klaus, yeah, that's right. which is yeah. still oh, one, yeah. of my, one of my favorite things. And of course, obviously, for anyone who doesn't know, Mike would go on and show run the originals with Julie. But like, was there any specific in terms of finding this character in the beginning? Did you have any sort of like inspiration for Klaus? Where did his voice come from? Well, I mean, I do remember this because I had joined the show at the end of 2010. It was midway through season two. And we were struggling with uh, that episode because it was this new character, very important mm-hmm. character residing in Matt Davis's, you know, acting. And I, we were there, we were late at night. Uh, it was Valentine's Day and uh, Kevin and Julie were just going to take this script. And they're like, we got it, kid. We're, we're just going to take it. We got it. And I was on my way to my car to go hang out with my fiance. And I got the call and they said, hey, can you come back in and just, you know, brainstorm with us a little bit. And I said, yes, so, you know, come in. I really want to get this right. And thank God Mimi was very understanding and was okay with that. And uh, Kevin started to talk about the 1920s and jazz and how Klaus was, you know, an aficionado of that time and that era and music and big band and all this stuff. And to hear Kevin talk about him, I was like, oh, this is a guy who's sublimating all of his uh, anger and rage and the survivor of abuse and and his monstrosity with this great love of life, you know, and that that played a part in it. You know, he's someone who has fun with, you know, ruining other people's days. And um, and that played a big part of it. And that's certainly what he did in that episode. And then I also got to co-write the finale of season two. And I specifically wrote all those scenes and, you know, Julie rewrote them, but I wrote all those scenes where, you know, Stefan is going in to negotiate with Klaus for a cure to save Damon as he dies of a werewolf bite. You do everything I say and I save your brother, that's the deal. In that negotiation, he just, Klaus is like the worst guy in the world who's saying to an alcoholic, here, have a drink, just have one drink and we'll call and I'll give you the cure. And that's what he does. And then 18 drinks later, he's off, uh, you know, over the season hiatus becoming this monster. And, and then I remember in coming back in season three, we had a boot camp, And on the very first day, Julie walked in and said, Kevin and I have this idea for a phone call at the end of episode one. And this is what we're going to build toward. And then, you know, as the weeks progressed and we talked about what those first few episodes would be, I remember there was a pitch on the table that episode five would be the one where Klaus and Stefan returned to small, uh, I almost said Smallville, um, (laughs) Mystic Falls. And they, you know, where Klaus is going to lead Stefan to come face to face with Elena. It's going to be bad. And I was like, I don't know if I believe that. I don't know if the audience wants to see that, you know, Stefan attacking and being vicious in front of Elena. And someone said, well, you know, how do we get him there? And then more conversation, more conversation. And someone said, well, he should compel him to turn off his emotions because then he will have nothing holding him back. Because the thing that holds him back, even when he's a ripper, is his love, you know? Mm -hmm. And if that were gone, you know, there is no limit to what he'll do. So that whole idea of turn it off. The only thing stronger than your craving for blood is your love for this one girl. Why don't you turn it off? No! Come on! Your humanity is killing you! All the guilt must be exhausting. Turn it off. No! I went into Julie's office and said, I want to write that episode. Please, let me write it. She's like, I don't know, you know, maybe. (laughs) And then she finally let me write it. and, And I, you know, I love that, so... Yeah. Oh God, that is yeah. to this day. I think that might be my favorite episode of the entire series. It, it's yeah. certainly, certainly top five for all those reasons. Because I mean, the, I mean, the Stefan Klaus, turn it off. There's, there's just nothing better, like acting wise and intensity, and also all the emotion between Rebecca and Klaus and her, you know, and her being sort of the the naughty wing woman, but also like really fraught in in their dynamic and then I also remember that was the first episode like season three was really hard for me personally because Kevin was moving away from the show I was really struggling with the story rhythms and how to and how to break these episodes to make them dynamic and when we got to the reckoning I realized like every single scene needs to move the story 
aggressively forward and to twist into something else. There cannot be a single scene in the structure that just sits there and does nothing. Like even the emotional stuff needs to have a twist at the end. And it was relentless. I mean, absolutely relentless. And then we tried to keep that up for like a really long time. Nothing just sits and rests. Nothing breathes. Everything drives to the next. And Narducci did such a just an incredible job in, in the words, you know, and that was, that was the, like, you know, not to blow you up to have Michael Narducci, like step into the spotlight was an incredible shift in me thinking, well, I can do this. Like if I've got someone like him in, in this, in this group, like we're going to get through this. Uh, I, I remember, it was, I thought it was a really talented group of people. And I remember, I mean, on every facet, I mean, I thought Dave Perkle was a great DP. I thought we had a great uh, retinue of directors. I remember going to set. I remember uh, seeing Claire for the first time in the gymnasium location. And I think, you know, it was pretty early. She had joined in episode three, episode four, and then the reckoning was episode five. And I just remember walking in and I was new, you know, I didn't really know any of the crew and Claire walks by and she knew every single person on that crew by a first name basis. And, you know, Claire is very popular, right away, <laughs> very, just, very popular. but just, you know, there's a lot of people in a the company. There's 150, 200 people in this village trying to make a show and just uh, very much owned the role. And I remember one of the things we had to do was because there were so many storylines in that episode and so much going on, it's basically Klaus, Stefan, and Rebecca invade the school on the night of the big, um, you know, they're doing pranks at the, at the high school and everybody is there and everybody gets wiped out and there's multiple deaths and it's terrible. But there's one scene that should have been in an, a longer episode, a much larger sequence, but it's just Claire walking down the hallway and finding Caroline, uh, uh, you know, hanging out with um, Michael Trevino. She just says, well, now I'm going to, I'm going to wipe you out. And we didn't even have to linger on this big action sequence. It was just a cut off of, you know, Rebecca's right. face as she fangs out and she comes in and literally the next time we see Rebecca, she's like hauling in the body of someone who she just, you know, mess. And you can do that when you have a great actor who can carry that. And there's so much implied by the cut, you know? And so I, I just think that that made that sequence work. What we had was a great team director, editor, and of course, Claire. So, you know, it's just pretty exciting. To I know. think at that episode that that was, I guess, right when I was like, I don't know if I'm staying, if they like me, if they're keeping me. And at that point I was like, oh goodness, please let this keep going on. Like this is so, everything that I wanted this role to be, it's there. And I, I just, it, it, it's the best character. It's still to this day after, you know, all these years, it's the one that I keep going back to and the one that I think about all the time. In that episode, all of this is going on. And obviously they're looking for her necklace, but just like the fact that all of this huge stuff is going on and like Rebecca's running around being like, why does this girl have my necklace? Was just like such an <laughs> insight into like the young girl that like we'll right. find out kind of Rebecca still very much so is of just like the petty high school, like this, hey, this chick has my necklace. Why? And I just, yeah. It's one of my favorite elements of that episode. God about the necklace. I, the necklace. I also like one cool That's thing incredible. is that every, everybody had a little hero moment, you know, like Matt Donovan, who doesn't always get yes. to be at the center of a storyline. Julie did this really smart thing where she made the writer's room put the names of the characters on a slip of paper and put them in a baseball cap that we literally passed around the writer's room. And every writer had to take out a character. And now you were the champion of that character going forward. And so you had to say in an episode where there's A, B, C, D, and E going on, you have to say, well, what about Matt? You know, if you, if you drew Matt, which I think I did. And I was like, well, we got to get Matt in here. And I can relate to Matt. Matt's in the weight room. He feels kind of crappy about himself. <laughs> he had a bad a bum arm at the end of season one. He's trying to get back in there and be a quarterback. He's not here for prank night. He's trying to be a quarterback again. And Bonnie had a great storyline in The Reckoning, you know, like, she, and she got to solve stuff without using magic. By the way, <laughs> fun, fun fact. It was that that the, the lifeguard and then this, the, the saving the day and how beautifully that whole sequence was shot. I shipped Bonnie and Matt from that oh, wow. day. And in my head, the end of the series would be a flash forward that Bonnie and Matt had gotten together and had a family. I never knew. And that. 
I held on to that in my head until we were breaking the series finale and broke an entire version of the season series finale that that had that, that like wow. Bonnie found her happiness with Matt, da- with Matt Donovan and they had everything they'd ever wanted, a family, a human family and beautiful Bennett Donovan children running around. And then we decided not to go into that far into the actual flash forwards yeah. in the future. We just did, we jumped into sort of peace instead. Sure. So I lost my for <sighs> five years. That was my plan. And then it just, <laughs> done. <laughs> Uh, the last thing I will say about the reckoning, just because I have to give it a call out, is the line: "The only thing stronger than your craving for blood is your love for this one girl." Uh, to this day, is like one of my favorite things in the entire world, and I feel like it just defines Stefan like entirely. Well, and that also defines Klaus's um, rhythms, which are Narducci's rhythms, right? Like that that is a line of poetry i don't write poetry like i don't write that i don't write lyrically i write kind of like this is how we talk and every now and then we put a british accent on it and we hope for the best <laughs> um, <laughs> but narducci really just had that like he had that love for prose and, and shakespeare and 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 all of that stuff that just infused this whole family with so much um, just layers of sophistication uh, it's a really great character that came about from the minds of Kevin and Julie. And I, I was just trying to keep up. Uh, you know, there, it's, you know, all the stuff that we're talking about is uh, it's just the, the intermeshing of those really cool characters, you know, and, you know, I, I was just lucky to be there. But the Claire, the, 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 what came out of the Claire incredible appearance in episode three and then five. And I've blown up Daniel Gilley's plenty in previous episodes. And of course, Joe Morgan will blow up in every single episode till the end of time. So we can just focus on you for the moment. (laughs) But Is when time came to write the origin story, Ordinary Mm -hmm. People, right? Right. Was that eight, 308? Um, We were really behind, like really, 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 really behind. Like desperately, I was having a nervous breakdown thinking like the entire ship was going to collapse behind. And Dreezy and I had to kind of pull that script together and like, probably I would say about 48 hour window um, from from a break that had gone south and had not really been the way to do this episode into like literally starting from scratch while the episode's in prep. But because of that, we had gotten the cuts for episode three and episode five. And suddenly here's Rebecca mm-hmm. popping in a way that you just you can't buy that. You know, you, you just you just luck into that. Um that lightning in a bottle kind of energy and, and success with the casting. So for me, that was what made, I'm sitting here staring at episode eight, freaking out because we don't, we're out of time. We don't know what to do. And I was trying to find like the emotional hook, not just the history of this family, but the emotional hook. And, and I realized that like everything could center around Rebecca's emotional experience, the feeling of of being the sort of the adored child amidst the abused family, right? The um, and then mm-hmm. the the one the young woman in the family of men, the one who mm-hmm. loved her mother, and then ultimately had to learn of her mother's betrayal, and just like watching her experience that, then and the adolescent girl who's who's adolescence is ripped away from her and now she's this immortal being and and but it, she doesn't know what it means and all of that and suddenly we were able to build the entire episode through sort of her point of view and her awakening to realize that she had been completely lied to and manipulated Klaus killed your mother he has a hold on you on me on everyone he has for a thousand years we have to make it stop Get out, shut up don't talk anymore nothing <sighs> But that scene where she's like crying in the Salvatore great room as like she's coming out of this memory. I finally found my voice for the show, which was this is a show about the fear of loneliness and the fear of being left behind and the fear of like getting to the end of your life and not having loved or been loved in the right way or losing your love and not ever being able to sort of see that again. So I'm carrying that epiphany into episode eight, along with Claire's performance and moving forward. Now every episode had to have that 
emotional core in it as well. So we're like building the formula for Vampire Diaries writing in real time over the course of the third season. But then you were so good at that. And then we wrote an entire episode where you like were basically the asshole that kept everybody in detention and had like, (laughs) what was it? Like the 72 pages of dialogue. Class is in session. You've all been compelled, you know the rules. Answer my questions honestly. No disobedience. No one leaves. April, my sweet, take notes. This is how you get answers in this town. Let's start with a little quiz. In the year 1114, my brother learned, thanks to yours truly, about a brotherhood of vampire hunters with tattoos that grew with each kill. These tattoos revealed what, Elena? Matt. <laughs> Do you want to know a, a fun fact about that episode? I had this horrible ulcer on the end of my tongue that episode, and it was the most dialogue I'd ever been given oh, to wow. say in my life. And we did it over and over and over again because it needed to be shot like kind of theatrically, right? Like in a play, and it was moving around. And the, this whole time, I'm like, "Don't mess this up, Claire. Don't mess." I I would use another word, but I don't want to swear. Um, <laughs> and I couldn't talk properly because of this thing, and I kept like trying so hard, and I. I was like, if this is the reason that I'm not invited back, this stupid old son of my tongue, because I can't deliver these lines, I'm going to be devastated. Thankfully, we got it. And, you know, it was it was hard, but everyone just rallied around and was so supportive. And that was such a fun episode to shoot after having those moments where I was vulnerable. And, you know, I really like there was I, there was a scene with me. And I don't know what episode it was, it, but it was in the Salvatore Great Room. So it must have been that episode where she tells me the truth and I learn and I'm like crushed. And so after that, I sort of like switch into this vile person who just wants everyone else to feel the pain that she's felt. And so it was, it was a really cool shift. And I'm thankful that I guess no one realized that I had this ulcer and I couldn't talk properly. Uh, (laughs) But that, when that episode came out, I realized like, okay, there's so many places that they, I hope they allow me to go with this character. And it seems like this writing is just opening up this entire world and there's so much to discover. And it, it's, it was just such a, a treat really. And I'm, I'm still to this day so grateful that they allowed me to sort of have a crack at it and see if I could survive. I Were read awesome? uh, that script real quick, ordinary people. I must've read it, you know, a hundred times because so obviously so much of that was the foundation of the show that we went on to do, you know, the spinoff. Mm-hmm. And the way uh, Claire was in those flashbacks, as everything Julie just said, informed our breaking of episode 16 of season one of the originals that Farewell to Storyville, which we thought, I thought, maybe Claire's last episode in this universe. And that flashback was all about how throughout her history as her brother's sister, she was defending him. She was there for him. She was protecting him. And that was so important and very much inspired by ordinary people. So, you know, I'm, I'm still friends with a lot of the writers on Vampire Diaries. And we talk about how you would come up with something to satisfy a deadline or a break. And that idea or that choice would reverberate for years. You know, the idea of the daggers can't be wielded by another mm-hmm. vampire. That was designed, I'm sorry, just to make an act out work. And yep. then, and then we had to carry that for the, you know, and this, uh, you know, the white oak steak and the silver filigree, which I don't know that we were ever quite satisfied with the look of it. It was kind of always feeling like it was falling apart a little bit. The white oak but, steak, but it was, it was like the best, most important, cherished, you know, MacGuffin weapon ever. So you know, it, it, was, it was a lot of attention to detail, a lot of great love. I know that uh, I, uh, you know, Evan Blyweiss and I were talking about the, uh, you know, he went off in a room with Nick Waters and came up with a whole mythology document. Julie was like, you guys go in there and figure this out. We got to figure out this script. stuff." And then they came in and they pitched, you know, like George Lucas sitting down to talk about Star Wars, this big thing. And then Julie whittled it down to what it became. And we needed, I remember to get from place to place in Mystic Falls without, you know, bringing around too much attention. So we came up with the Blyweiss tunnels. Do you remember that? Just all this system of- under- Oh, the tunnels. <laughs> Yes. Tunnels, you know, and then that was where Rebecca tortured Lena in episode 315. 
which mm-hmm. I co-wrote with Evan. And and I that and that's where we discovered the key to the white oak steak being part of the tree. And I, I love, by the way, Claire, I love your performance in that episode. You just went after Elena. There was one point where you were pouring gasoline on her and then you threw <laughs> the can of gasoline and you were trying to light a match on a you know the set and it kept going out. <laughs> and you had to maintain your intensity as you were torturing this person. And you were you were so so great at that. And the last thing I'll say about that is I remember Gillies, who I did not know very well, really came at me hard in some emails like I should I should be doing this, I should be doing like what like what's really happening, and because of our exchange, um, you know, he kind of really challenged me to buckle down on what was that relationship between Elijah and Rebecca in that episode because he was basically sending his sister to do his dirty work. He was, he didn't want to torture Elena. He kind of liked Elena. She was a nice human. She reminded him of past, you know, as we learned about later in in the originals, Tatiana or whatever her name was. So he sends his sister to be the heavy. And I always thought that was, you know, really interesting. And that was, you know, Daniel kind of forcing the issue and wanting to unpack that a little bit. But um, I, I guess my point is we had a really good collaboration, you know, from our showrunner, Julie, to you know, good group of people and the writing staff and then actors coming in with questions that helped inform things, you know, Odetta, Warner Brothers, you know, really good people that were just wanted to maintain the quality of this show. And it was oftentimes fraught and difficult, but I think it it helped elevate the material. And the ratings started going up, like, which never happens. That's, that's the moment I took a breath and I'm like, okay, it was about, I think it was between episode six and seven or episode seven and eight, right around there, the ratings, which had been pretty steady for two seasons started ticking up and we all sort of were like, oh, okay, no one's fired. No one's getting canceled. And then we get to, I mean, we should talk about Klaus and Caroline, of course, because that was 311, but (laughs) we'll circle back, but we get to, the, um, you know, the Michelson ball, mm-hmm. the, um, that's another Drees episode. Yeah. Right? Three, four, three, four, <laughs> yeah. Oh, Drees. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And Grismer, who was the director, who was a really brilliant, um, hobbyist photographer. I mean, he's professional, I guess. And then he shoots pictures for a living, but he also, he carries around like six different still cameras at all points and Polaroids mm-hmm. and this and that takes this picture of the entire original family lined up down this, the, the balustrade of the staircase and like treated it and sent it to me. And I sent it to Peter Roth. I emailed it to him when I got the picture and I said, here's your spinoff. And he was like, oh, ha, 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 ha. And I was like, okay, well, that like, that's not exactly a green light. Um, but a bit later we were, and I don't want to get too far ahead of, of, of the story, but we were pitching sort of the last half of the season. And the plan was to kill Klaus because Klaus was the villain and you got to kill the villain, you know, like he'd been a villain for now almost two seasons, both in pres- in person and not. And so we were going to kill him because like, that's what you do. Successful villain, you kill. And Mark Pedowitz was like, are you out of your goddamn mind? <laughs> you don't kill one of the best pieces of casting you've ever seen on this show. <laughs> like you're crazy. And I said, you know, and, and he said, I mean, like, and then I think we wanted to kill Tyler Lockwood too. Like we we're just going to like have Klaus kill Tyler and then kill Klaus. It was going to be a whole bloodbath. And Mark was like, well, why don't you just like spin Tyler Lockwood off into a show with like Caroline? They'll go to Chicago and they'll live in the big city. And I said, well, the spinoff I'd really like to do is the original family. And he's like, you're kidding. And I'm like, yeah. And I said, damn the picture. And he was like, done. <laughs> so that was kind of how that came to pass, which is great. But it's that picture just represented everything, the entire family working and like, it, you know, within the show and then ultimately having the power to be its own show. Yeah. Oh, the original ball. Another great like dance scene moment on this show. Mm-hmm. Just incredible. But wait, okay, you mentioned Claroline because obviously we have Caroline's birthday, Tyler bites her. He was, you know, because of the sire bond, all this stuff. Was that seeing the moment you kind of noticed that spark or were you guys kind of already marinating on the Claroline of it all at that point? I, Narduch, tell me if I'm wrong, but I think that birthed the chemistry as opposed to the other way around. Um, and I can't remember entirely. All I know is when I saw that scene, because that speech on the page is really beautiful. And Dreezy and Rebecca wrote that. So you read it and you're like, oh, that's nice. And then you shoot it and your 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 mind is blown because it's just, I mean, it's just like, 
just, I mean, Caroline, Candace, we always used to make the joke, had chemistry with everybody. And Caroline, as a result, had chemistry with everybody, which is why she dated uh, on the, the Caroline was in a relationship at one point with pretty much everybody on the show. Um, and it worked. Every relationship worked. Right. But that was like, oh, boy. I mean, how do you even. It's so toxic, too. I mean, like, again, that little storyline, that little romantic relationship would never get get through a writer's room today because it's just unbelievably fucked up. But boy, <laughs> was it good. The way I remember it uh, was, you know, Rebecca Sonnenschein is a huge friend of mine and an influence, and I love her to death. And I, I remember as I got to know Rebecca, I got to know, you know, she was kind of from a small town. And she got out of that small town. And I, I think one of the things that she tried to do was in writing Klaus and Caroline was to imply here was a girl from a small town who wanted, you know, the, the greatest temptation to her would be what does the world have to offer? And, and again, in the same way, kind of Klaus approached Stefan by tempting him with the thing he couldn't resist. It, it's same thing with Caroline. He's a master at figuring out what's the thing that you want and how do I dangle that in front of you in order to beguile you? And in, in, in that relationship, I do think, you know, he legitimately had a fondness for her and he legitimately was intrigued by her. And then he's a smooth talker, which is interesting because it's not the guy he was when we met him in the flashbacks, when he was abused little kid, you know? So mm -hmm. telling the story of how that abused little kid became this guy was always really interesting. We also, I mean, we have to touch on season three. I've, I mean, I've put this in print. I've written it. I think it's the greatest handling of a love triangle ever. Mm. Um, it's the pacing of it is so beautiful. I still like quite often think about the fact that Stefan and Elena kissed once and it is in the, that is, incredible that you guys mm. pulled that off and obviously you've got like damon and elena's first kiss you've got the ridiculous hot motel scene mm. but were you not like this is someone who's obviously never written an episode of television in my head there's like a whiteboard that's like okay stefan got this moment does damon get this moment because it's just <laughs> so beautifully balanced like what was the process for you all of like obviously damon's got to work his way in enough to where the fans have to think she might choose him but ultimately, like, you can't lose Stefan because she is going to choose him at the end of that season. Like, what was that balance like for you all? Oh, man, that was um, pretty much everything we were doing at all points was trying to hold up the Stefan and Elena relationship as magical and important while holding off the undeniability of the chemistry and the wickedness and all that great gothic like bad boy romance that Damon represented. And so the existence of Damon in that story did all the work for itself. So the heavy lifting was really in balancing Stefan. How far could we take Stefan to the dark side and not have him lose Elena's faith? Um, how, how much could we let Elena be sort of stirred and awoken on a physical level by Damon and not make Stefan unsexy to her, you know? And it was really just about trying to protect and preserve Stefan and Elena with this like Mack truck of Damon always, always running at us. And we all knew that Damon and Elena were the inevitability. And we just wanted to hold that off as long as humanly possible, because once she went down that road, it would be a very difficult road to ever veer off from. And within that, we knowing that inevitability, we wanted to give it an um, uh, integrity and authenticity. And so in the finale, the whole idea of like, which road is she going to take and which guy is she going to choose, which we knew at the beginning of the season. I mean, that was the Kelly and, you know, Brenda, I mean, uh, Brandon and Dylan, you know, and <laughs> we, we knew it wasn't going to be, I choose me, put it this way for those of you who are old enough to understand the original 90210 love triangle at its best. Um, but it, even in her choosing Stefan and her saying, Perhaps if I had met you first and then within the body of the flashbacks, we acknowledge that she, in fact, had met him first. That was the kind of trickery that we, where we were really sort of working at our most evil, which is like still trying to be like Stephanie Lane in love forever. But guess what, people? It's coming. It's absolutely coming. Oh, I love I mean, this whole season now, it's like because we haven't even talked about doesn't do not go gentle in that season. Yeah. yeah. 
That was episode. Holy moly. Oh my gosh. Oh my yeah. gosh. A lark in the single tear. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, before we get to that, I will say the first time uh, Damon and Elena kiss, it was in 310. Yes. And Julie made me rewrite that scene, I swear to God, probably 50, 60 times. I was on set. We were shooting other scenes in that episode. And I was on the phone and Julie was like, it's not there. And I was like, we're shooting the scene like tomorrow. It's not there, you know? And, and, and I think that that forced something to happen. And it was ultimately, uh, you know, it needed to be what it was. I know, believe me, I get it. Brother's girl and all. No. No, you know what? If I'm gonna feel guilty about something, I'm gonna feel guilty about this. It's everything you wanted. It's everything you don't. It's one door swinging open. And one door swinging closed. And there was a great music cue to that, which was gonna be something else, which we lost yeah, at the last It was minute. gonna be New York. Um, By Snow Patrol. Right? Snow Patrol's New York, oh, which wow. Shonda had. Yeah. We found, come to find out that Shonda wanted it for uh, Grays, I think. And Shonda had a thing. She's like, if I'm playing your song, you're not giving it to anybody else. Like, sure. all power to Shonda. And so we were like, this is the perfect song placement. How can we lose this song placement? We're great. This, the whole scene's ruined. And then Chris Malaire finds, wasn't it some unknown artist? Like, he did that all the time. But Narduch, speaking to your um, your experience on that, after the sort of scheduling debacle that got us to episode nine, 309, in which the entire system was about to collapse. Mm -hmm. I had to look around and say, okay, I just worked so hard to make sure I didn't ruin the show. But now on a logistical level, I'm about to ruin the show because I am so busy. I'm like, you know, when you're, when you're an insecure showrunner, you just want to do it all yourself. you got to make sure you have it all done. And it's really hard in those moments of insecurity to delegate. And I had to look around and say, like, if I die tomorrow or have a nervous breakdown, which I'm on the precipice of at this point, the show cannot continue. Like, there's, like, Caroline will just die next, you know? <laughs> like, Dreezy will be, like, one week behind my nervous breakdown. Like, th there's not, we haven't done enough to prepare and empower everybody else to take on all this work. And so I decided for episode 10, because of Narducci's work on 305, this is going to be the script that I did not rewrite a single word of. And that would have been the first time in, in the, in the show where I had literally, I was like, I don't care how much time it takes and how much he, like it, I drive him crazy. This script will be his and it will be his alone. And then he will go to set and he will produce it and he will be able to feel proud of it and have ownership over it. And so that's why in that scene, I would have like normally just like open a bottle of wine, lit a cigarette and pop that thing out in like four minutes, you know, cause like my brain just works like that in crisis. But in that scene, I was like, no, you can do better. There's, there's more girl things here. There's more femininity you can find. There's more this, there's more that, whatever. But every single word in that script, Narduch, if, correct me if I'm wrong, you wrote, you did not get rewritten on that. And that was the first in the entire show series of Vampire Diaries. And, you know, in fairness, every time, because I bet there could be some aspiring writers listening to this. And if there are, I do want to say, in a TV writing situation, you're on a team and people are pitching ideas and you're not alone. You know, obviously as a writer, you're not alone because you revise. And so, you know, your past self, your current self and your future self are working in conjunction to perfect the script. But at the same time, you know, I had great writers like, you know, Al and Turi and, you know, Al Septian and Turi Meyer and, um, you know, Rebecca Sonnenshine and Caroline Dries and Brian Young and Evan Blyweiss. And I know I'm missing people, but. Finchie and Brett. Finch. Yeah. Were Finchie and Brett there yet? I thought they Brett came, came in. Mid Brett came in mid-season. Okay. And then Finchie came in somewhere around that too. Yeah. So all great writers pitching great ideas. And of course, Julie. And Julie always had such great perspective, even in the breaks. Like for instance, going back to the triangle of it all, we forget that in 314, it ends not with Damon and Elena looking like they're going to get together, but with Damon hooking up with Rebecca. Oh yeah, that scene. You know, that dress. Yeah, it was a pretty incredible scene. And then, you know, we had to pick that up in three fifteen, 
And I remember one of my favorite scenes with Claire was Claire kind of walking out of that Salvatore house, Elena seeing her and with the death glare on Elena's face, even though she wasn't with Damon and Claire, you know, smirking. But then Claire also, you know, Rebecca going home and having to talk to Cole and Elijah and, you know, every brother who's going to give her crap. And she has one of my favorite lines. Cole is giving her, you know, talking some kind of smack about being out all night. And Rebecca says, watch your mouth. And the next thing that comes out of it is going to be your teeth. Be your teeth. I love that. I really love that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, like all of those things, I don't know, we're, we're, we're working together in conjunction with a team. Julie has a master plan that I think, you know, she is, to answer your question, Sam, I think organically piecing together based on her desire of what she as a fan would want to see you know, from this triangle. I, I don't think it's mathematics. I think it's much more, you know, like an organic thing that is alive and she would respond to it. And Julie would come in and break an episode backwards, which is the first time I've ever seen anyone do that. You know, I know we were going to get to here. And so what we need to do is this to get to that, to that, to get to that. And you would see how she would kind of grow things uh, in reverse. And I, you know, learned a lot, uh, following her on that show. Yeah. By the way, you mentioned the hotel room moment, Sam. Yeah. And again, that is like, you know, you pull that, that old chestnut out of every fangirl moment you've ever had watching sure. TV, but like special props to Brian Young, who like totally like speaks that same language and knows exactly what that, that moment and that scene needed to be. And then it was Grismer again, who came in and like Grismer had this knack of being able to like sell you in a moment without you realizing it was a director doing it. Like where, like when they kiss and the light comes on in the background in the parking lot, like all that stuff is totally designed and planned for maximum like manipulation, I guess, but maximum fan success. Sure. That, oh, God, that was a good one. Well, I mean, getting to the finale, obviously you all mentioned Rick dies. It's devastating. But then he's instantly back as like this original hunter, crazy, powerful vampire. And Claire, I want to talk to you because not only is Rebecca kind of the person who essentially kills Elena, like she stands on the bridge Mm -hmm. and messes it up. Mm -hmm. But getting to kind of your evolution of playing this character, I feel like the one thing that was always the foundation for Rebecca is that she was immortal, right? Aside from maybe being worried about her brother staking her for a hundred years or something, she had that foundation. How did that shift when all of a sudden, like they were, all the originals were running for their lives. I mean, there's that devastating moment in the woods when Elijah tells her that Klaus is dead because they think he is. And it's so upsetting. What do you remember kind of about filming that finale? I just remember that there was like, such a such a shift that was taking place and again it goes back to those that vulnerable element of Rebecca and the originals and this this crazy badass character who fears nothing and can crush people and rip someone's teeth out and rip someone's heart out to this like human element to her that Mm -hmm. we realize like it was there that 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 girl that was turned into a vampire, that girl that just wanted a family, that girl that just wanted to have a normal life and to find love, like that's there and we start to see all of that. And I think that was just a really cool moment for Rebecca, but also all of us originals in general, um, leading into the next season, how this story was going to pan out. Yeah, oh my gosh. Rebecca on the bridge as the car swerves and goes off and then you're underwater and you're intercutting and it's cigarettes. And that music, which we mm-hmm. lost at the last second in our sound mix and couldn't use it to the point where we had to put something else in there on the day of the sound mix. The episode was literally airing 48 hours later and we couldn't find the song at all. And it was ruining everything. And the entire sequence was like lost. And Chris Miller, our music supervisor, basically got on the phone to... Sweden, <laughs> Sigurus, are they <laughs> Swedish? Wherever they're from, and called the artists in the band to basically say, please give us this, Yonzi and uh, whoever else, and had like was hunting them down one one by one, basically saying, we we need this song. And at like two o'clock in the morning, when we were delivering it at six o'clock in the morning, they said yes, and we got to keep it. 
That was I really had little, no the behind idea the scenes drama. Yeah, music it played was such a huge role so, in this show. I had, I mean, so I knew much. it, and I knew how much you guys loved Chris and like how important those songs were. But like to see you guys talk about, to hear you guys talk about remembering moments based on the music is really interesting. Every time I hear that song now, I have a Pavlovian response. In fact, there's a Vampire <laughs> Diaries Spotify playlist of all the songs. I can't remember if I mentioned this before, but like all the songs that anybody ever used on Vampire Diaries. And I'll play it just for like nostalgia. And I'll get it to a point where like the first strands of like Drop in the Ocean or um, or that Cigarro song or the freaking Damon Elena dancing in the street before the, you know, the sleep spell mm-hmm. thing. And I cry, like I actually cry. Um, music really like it's just that extra element of like an emotional uh, an emotional like line of dialogue for a lot of what we did yeah chris yeah. moller major props genius Bravo. huh yeah genius that, that sequence that last act the two last seven minutes of, of of that finale is one of the best sequences we've probably ever done on the show mm-hmm. just in terms of like firing on all cylinders production wise acting wise emotion music editing tyler cook i think edited that episode um it just that will live on that will live on for me as my favorite my absolute favorite season finale of the entire show a plus underwater acting which i can't i can't <laughs> say happens in a, yeah, every show. not easy <laughs> not easy oh amazing all right i think that's that's pretty much the time we have thank you all so much for talking all things season three and for Anyone listening, stick around because we will be back to talk about all things season four. Woo-hoo.